Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Old Dominion University. It is my pleasure to be the host for today's event. Today's event is one of the Reyes presentations. So Reyes stands for Remote Experience for Young Engineers and Scientists. We have participants today that are graduate students, undergraduate students, and perhaps uh, students or to be students from all parts of the world. So we welcome you. And we hope that you will be able to partake in future events organized by the Reyes team. So uh, in this slide on the bottom, you get to see our social media links. So please take a snapshot and please feel free to follow up with our Reyes events. My name is Oscar Gonzalez. I'm the chair of the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department here at Oldman University. And again, it's my pleasure to introduce you to this special event. So I talk about Bet Reyes. Currently, the team that is organizing this event and the events that we had last summer consists of the people on this slide. So we like to especially say a shout out to Giovanna Gennard and Raul Briseño. They're the ones that have put a lot of their effort to make this happen. So thank you, both of you. Uh, this event is actually also a joint event. So today we have a joint Reyes EC graduate colloquium event. So again, I'm the chair of electrical and computer engineering. So we have a, a, a very strong department. We do a lot of activities. We have students working on their bachelor degrees and master's degrees and doctorate degrees. Uh, all of our students get a chance to perform undergraduate research. Let me tell you what is coming up in Reyes. So today's event, we're in October, is about to be introduced. But before introducing the speaker for today, let me ask you to put a placeholder for the next two Reyes presentations. On November 19th, we have the director of the Jefferson Lab up in Newport News here, uh, Atomic Facility. The facility is not only the director, but he's also the ODU Governor's Distinguished CBAP Professor. So that will be an excellent presentation on the work that is being done not too far away from us. And we have a very special event, perhaps announced for the first time today. In December, on December 1st at 3 p.m., we have Dr. Ellen Ochoa, a former NASA astronaut, a former director of the NASA Johnson Space Center. She will be our special host for that event, for the last Reyes presentation of this semester. And over time, we'll be preparing a list for the events next semester. Okay. So let's get to the main uh, presentation today. So I'm going to introduce Dr. Jamie Zagorian. Um, before going through the formal procedures, I, I do need to go back a little bit. I, I joined ODU in 1988, and I got to know Jamie's families from the time I joined ODU. So I have known Jamie from, for a long time. And, and let me just mention that I still see vividly in my head some of his activities at ODU when he was a junior and senior in high school, in his schooling back then. In those days, uh, the College of Engineering at ODU would host uh, engineering open house competitions during engineering week, which is a special week during February. Uh, Jamie impressed me because of his resourcefulness and creativity to solve problems. If you remember one of his little cars running from one end to the other through one of our hallways. Uh, so very, very creative. Uh, that inspired me when he joined ODU for one, actually two bachelor degrees. And so he, I was able to get him to join one of our senior capstone design teams. And he was a great contributor to uh, the team that I was advising at that time. Uh, but Jamie went on to uh, get two bachelor's degrees at ODU, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and then he went on to Georgia Tech where he got his MS and PhDs in mechanical first and then electrical engineering. So he's got a lot of tools at his disposal, and that's what we're going to see a little bit more of today in his presentation. He has been working at Butterfly Network since the year 2000, where he's currently the director of the transducer engineering department. And his work focuses on the design, mm -hmm. testing, and production of the transducer module using a portable whole body 
IQ ultrasound probe. So I'm looking forward to this presentation. So let me not say much more. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'll let Jamie share his screen. So again, welcome. And I do hope you enjoy this presentation. Let me say this uh, as a matter of uh, planning. Where you're watching a presentation, at the bottom of the screen, you can type a question. Uh, later on, at the end of the presentation, I will be able to read those questions. So please uh, do enter your location and start typing questions. You can type them anytime throughout the presentation. I will make a record of them. And then I'll select the questions and I'll read them at the end of the presentation. So please uh, do that. And in between, you can also maximize the presentation screen. Again, thank you. I'm sharing. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's truly an honor to be here with you today. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Um, hopefully, I can be somewhat informative and uh, hopefully have a little bit of fun with this presentation as well. So the title is Butterfly IQ Ultrasound Probe and the decisions that led me to join this startup. So. You know, in this particular talk, I wanted to kind of cover, you know, how did I end up at Butterfly going from undergraduate, graduate, uh, some of the work I did right after graduate school, and then I can dive into Butterfly Network, the probe itself, uh, what I'm allowed to talk about, uh, and then give you a live demo since I have a probe here with me and I can share my uh, cell phone uh, and then we can have any questions. Uh, and just for kicks, um, you know, this is my my parents who actually taught me at home during high school uh, before I went to Old Dominion University. Um, and I was taught at home with uh, my sisters uh, that you can see down below. So, uh, you know, as Dr. Gonzalez said, I started at Old Dominion University. I did my ES in uh, mechanical engineering and in electrical engineering, and I did a minor in studio art. Uh, turns out I wanted to learn how to weld and the art department had a lot of welders available. And I started taking one class after the other. Uh, and I really enjoyed that, that hands-on knowledge. Um, Old Dominion also afforded me the opportunity to travel abroad. Uh, I was able to go to Australia for a year. Um, and I also went to Costa Rica uh, to get my Spanish credits out of the way. And I will never forget Old Dominion, especially because it was my first experience in the clean room. You know, in the upper right-hand corner, I found that I really loved working with microelectronics. Uh, this was the very first time I had ever uh, worked in a clean room, had done microfabrication, and I fell in love with it. And you'll see some other clean room photos, you know, as we continue on. But it was during one of these presentations uh, that somebody said, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. I know this has been quoted, you know, many other places, but this has been true, I think, through my entire career. You know, I wake up every morning, I love going to school, and I love going to work. So uh, this is one of my art projects uh, from way back in the day uh, and a very dated photo of myself uh, during one of our summer camps at Old Dominion. It was a computer summer camp. And as you can see there, I actually have a lot more hair than I do now. So at one point, I did have a lot of hair. So, you know, after uh, undergraduate, uh, you know, I didn't want to get a real job. So the socially acceptable form of procrastination is, of course, graduate school. And as long as you're making progress and you're not incurring debt, you know, your parents can't complain too much. So I ended up working on uh, micro machine sensors and transducers under Levent de Gerdeken at Georgia Tech. And then I ended up working on um, in this particular technology area called CMUTS, you know, which stands for Capacitive Micro Machined Ultrasonic Transducer. And I'm going to spend a few slides, you know, sort of going over this research because it actually forms the basis for the butterfly ultrasound probe. It's an enabling technology. So this was the title of my uh, thesis when I finally graduated. Uh, and you know, we'll cover a little bit more about this. And as you can see, here's another clean room photo at, in Georgia Tech. Um, I just fell in love with working in the clean room, working under the microscopes. So the research motivation, heart disease. Um, it's still a number one killer. And I updated this slide for 2017 statistics. So heart disease is still the number one killer, even more than cancer in the United States. You know, typically angiography is used for uh, diagnosis. Uh, unfortunately, you know, you're looking at x-rays. Um, it does show the blood flow, but it doesn't show any vessel wall information. 
So if you want to use something like uh, non-ionizing radiation, you know, ultrasound uh, is a, a key technology for that. And it also can give you vessel wall cross-sectional information. So you can kind of see what's going on in the clogged, you know, arteries and veins. So along come these IVIS catheters um, introduced in the 1990s, usually about one to five millimeter in diameter. Um, and they're all piezoelectric based. So these transducer elements, they're thinned, diced, and placed around a catheter. So they're extremely small. And typically what you're looking at is the sidewall. So they'll go up through the arteries and veins, usually through the femoral artery. Um, they'll rotate them around uh, quite often and they'll get a view of the side and they can retract at a known rate and you can come up with a 3D you know, image or you know, a cross section that looks like this. Unfortunately, you, know, you don't have the ability to look in front of you as you're going. And that can lead to problems in terms of you know, puncturing the sidewall. Um, and what we're looking at here uh, is, is the vessel, um, some calcification. So there's a lot of information here that you don't get from x-rays or angiography. So this was the goal, a forward-looking IVIS catheter. So that's intravascular ultrasound imaging. So we're looking at you know, a very, very small donut um, with about 100 elements on it. And as you can imagine, if your cable is only a millimeter and a half in diameter, the number of cables that you can have coming out is very limited. So that means you need to have elements up front, but you also need to have electronics. Uh, we need low power, low noise. Um, unfortunately, piezoelectric technology was not really ideal for this application. So what could be used for something like this? Well, it turns out there's an alternative for ultrasound generation, which is the CMUT, the Capacitive Micromachined Ultrasonic Transducer. Now, the principles are relatively simple. Uh, building them is a little bit more tricky. You know, the basic CMUT uh, has a top electrode, a bottom electrode, and a vacuum gap. And it's very simple to operate. You apply a, an electric field through a DC bias, and you know, opposite charges attract, so it gets pulled in. If you put an AC signal on top of it, it'll bounce around to generate sound. Conversely, if sound comes in, you're changing the capacitance value, and that can be detected. So to give you an idea about the size, so one of the arrays that I built in graduate school uh, was about 35 millimeters across uh, with a 25 micron electrode. So this whole black square that you see in the upper right-hand corner is about the diameter of a human hair. And when you start to look at the isolation levels and the vacuum gap, the gaps that we're talking about fabricating are extremely thin on the order of a tenth of a micron or you know, a thousandth the width of a human hair. Now, in particular, one of the promises of this sort of technology, which is also the basis of the butterfly technology, is the ability to build these sorts of micro-machined devices, which utilize semiconductor fabrication techniques directly on top of their electronics and in particular, custom electronics. So what did we do? So we built a CMOS wafer. Now, I didn't build this myself. This was in conjunction with uh, other teams at Georgia Tech in the MIST group. Um, and we were able to get a, a full 8-inch wafer. So in these uh, full 8-inch wafers, we pulled out six die that were 2 by 3 die for processing. And I took these into the Georgia Tech clean room and you know, we started making electrical connections to these little teeny spots on the ASIC. And from there, we were able to fabricate these dual ring structures. So those are the transducer elements, and they're connected to the electronics. And there's even a hole in the center for the guide wire to go through. So after we spend a lot of time figuring out how to build these and integrating them directly on the electronics, you know, we were able to image. So what is the first thing you image? Well, usually just a bunch of wires. So nothing too crazy, but you know, we were able to wire bond it uh, into a little chip carrier. Um, so in this particular version, there were 56 transmitters and 48 receivers with a 25 volt pulsers built in to generate the AC signal. And here you can see that, you know, we can easily see the wires. Uh, so proof of concept, um, very, straightforward. So there's 30 dB gain, 40 dB gain. 
So then after wires, you know, very simple targets. Now I want to do that 3D volume that I can see in front. So what did we find? Well, a chicken heart. You know, that was always fun to go to the store and say, you know, can I buy some chicken hearts? So we were able to suspend the chicken hearts, you know, filled with fluid. Um, and we could do, you know, volumetric reconstruction. Um, this was using the uh, MicroView GE. So it was not done in real time uh, just because of the parasitics and the latency. But here, oh, I actually forgot there was a nice video here. So we can see the, you know, as we pass through um, scanning across the edge of the chicken heart. So this was the basis of my, my graduate work uh, at Georgia Tech. So, you know, at some point, I decided I, you know, should probably graduate, uh, you know, and I didn't quite know what I wanted to do. However, I did have a bunch of extracurricular activities at Georgia Tech where I made a lot of friends. Uh, I was a residential advisor for graduate and family housing. Um, I helped out with the high ropes course. I was a Baja team welder. Um, and I did a bunch of other activities. And one key takeaway was never underestimate networking because it was through one of these affiliations that I found my next job. And while I was working on all of these projects, one of my fellow graduate students came over to me and said, hey, we wanna work on the Red Bull Soapbox Derby race. We know that you have a lot of skills. You have a little prototyping shop that you can build things. Uh, would you be willing to come work with us uh, uh, and do it together as a team. And I said, sure, why not? So uh, David Torello on the left of me here in the middle uh, was one of my uh, fellow graduate students. And the gentleman all the way on the right is Kemp, who's a friend that I made and a great networking opportunity. So we were the, the chic racers. Uh, this nice lady here had the chic boutique tour company. And she, we ended up building this pair of high heeled shoes that ran down the track. Um, in the downtown Atlanta. And so during this process though, uh, we started out with a frame, you know, we built it up. This was at a shop that I had at the time. Um, and we ended up with this lovely pair of high heeled shoes. Now, Kemp had applied for a job at a company called Exponent. And he told me all about it. And he said, hey, this job is not for me, but it might be for you. Would you like me to give them your resume? And I was like, oh, that would be great. This sounds like an awesome job. And I'm going to describe the job a little bit in the next slide or two. Uh, so I was super lucky and fortunate. Out of graduate school, I applied for one job and I got it. And I went to go work for Exponent Inc., uh, a failure analysis company. However, uh, this particular part of the failure analysis group worked on technology development. And I ended up going to work in Afghanistan for a year, doing rapid prototyping for the army in the field. So all of those other jobs I had on the side uh, were extremely beneficial to me when I went into interview at Exponent. You know, they went through all of my technical skills, which were, uh, I had a solid foundation from Mold Dominion. I learned a lot while at Georgia Tech. Uh, they asked me about you know, anything in between. And then I got to the extracurricular sides and everybody wanted to know about, you know, working on my school bus, working for graduate and family housing, um, you know, anything and everything in between. And so uh, here in Exponent, we were actually, this is a shipping container that had been converted into a mobile lab. Oops. So inside this lab, uh, we had, you know, all sorts of bits and pieces, electronic testing capabilities, microscopes. We had the ability to do CNC machining, 3D printing. We had welders. Uh, we had uh, carts that would come out of the middle. And we would go all around Afghanistan finding projects for soldiers uh, where there might not be a solution right now. And they didn't want to wait you know, months to get a solution. It could be a one-off project. It could be um, something that was systemic and that, you know, needed to be solved, you know, long-term as well. So just for fun, you know, some of the extreme conditions, because our lab moved around and I was there for a full year, I experienced 120 degree uh, summers. I experienced uh, golf ball sized hail and the occasional sandstorm, just like from a movie you know, we were on top of our shipping container and we saw it rolling in and we immediately buttoned down the hatches. So one of the key takeaways from this particular job was being flexible. 
and never saying it's not my job. And you know, this still follows me today. I try and never say it's not my job. I will say, okay, maybe I don't have the bandwidth right now, but you know, I'd love to help you if I can, or, hey, maybe you should go talk to another person uh, that I know of who actually has a lot more experience in this than I am. Uh, and that's actually served me very well you know, up until this point. And so while I was over there, we had to do PCB design. Every once in a while, we had to break out a sewing machine. Uh, we did 3D printing, um, so solid modeling, um, electronics for all sorts of different projects that came up. Some of them were for the special forces groups, and then some of them were for the everyday soldier going out on patrol. So after I came back from Exponent, this is when I was hired by Butterfly. And at the time, they didn't even want to tell me what they were working on. So they said, hey, don't worry, you're going to have fun. And it's going to be related to what you were doing in graduate school. And I said, well, where is it? And they're like, Guilford, Connecticut. I was like, Guilford? You know, what's in Guilford? Turns out it's a very, very small coastal town. And most people know it only with respect to New York City. So if you see here in this picture, there's New York City. Go north a bit and then, you know, hang a right and you get to Guilford. It's about a two, two and a half hour drive. But it turns out the founder was Jonathan Rothberg. And Jonathan Rothberg, if you get a chance to Google him, uh, he's a winner of the Presidential Medal uh, of Science. Um, and he is one of the pioneers in DNA sequencing on a chip. And so one of his goals was to take some sort of medical technology and say, OK, what if we were to look at what's going on today and rebuild it from the ground up, especially leveraging semiconductor design? So when I started at Butterfly, it was about six years ago. And uh, they said, OK, we'll have a product out shortly. So come you know, a few years later, 2017. So meet the Butterfly IQ, coming in 2018. And through all that time, you know, what I became responsible for was the transducer module, which is the front part, you know, of the of the probe. And we're going to dig a little bit more into the technical details now uh, of sort of what was going on there. So, and this is based on the same MEMS technology that I was doing in graduate school. So those same capacitive micro machined ultrasonic transducers that are monolithically integrated with an ASIC. So here are a few pictures. Now, unfortunately, I can't talk about anything too proprietary, but all of the stuff that I'm going to tell you about can be found on the web in one form or another, either from a teardown, from our own website. Uh, but there's a lot of interesting information here. So the, this is the front transducer module. Here it is with an open face. And on the right-hand side, it's covered with our you know, RTV-based uh, lens material. And somebody on the internet has done a cross-section, which I can share here. So there's the lens. There's the ultrasound chip. Uh, you can see the shroud, uh, the black aluminum uh, piece. We have a heat spreader, which is aluminum nitride, um, and then a very uh, densely packed PCB. So I believe if you count them up, there's about 16 layers there. You know, and then you have the connectors on the bottom. So when I first started at Butterfly, I was mostly working on the designing and simulating. But as time went on, I had to work on testing and then packaging prototyping, manufacturing, then evaluating those uh, manufacturing product, and then finally working on support. And so that included traveling overseas to different packaging houses and semiconductor fabs. So as you see, I got to continue wearing my bunny suits. And um, it also included uh, sometimes the odd and end task, like I had to go get a forklift license because nobody had one. And, you know, uh, you just do what it takes to get the job done. And I think that was extremely appreciated at Butterfly. So currently today, uh, we have a transducer lab, uh, which looks like this on a busy day. I grabbed a few shots that don't show anything proprietary. Um, we have interns over the summer. Uh, so there's quite a few people working right now um, in these photos. Currently, most of the transducer lab is shut down due to COVID, but we have some ongoing efforts. And you know, working for a startup is kind of interesting. They really like to feed you. You know, they'll say, you know, work as long as you want, you know, we'll feed you, uh, just stay and have fun. 
And, you know, here we are on the left-hand side. Uh, during the summer, this was a lunch we had uh, on the right hand, you know, in the middle. That's one of my summer interns. Um, she was actually doing prototype builds of the transducer modules. And I gave her instructions on how to produce these modules. She went through, did it as best as she thought she knew how to do it. And then we were able to kind of go through and say, ah, where were those gaps in the knowledge? Because at this time we were transferring that knowledge to an overseas contract manufacturer. And it was extremely useful to see, you know, how I've been doing it for a long time. I try to give the instructions with the documentation um, and see how somebody else interprets it. And that was, you know, super beneficial. In the bottom right-hand side, one of our uh, mechanical electrical engineering interns is working on custom phantoms. Uh, she was actually revamping uh, calibration tools. So when you do color Doppler and things like that, you need to make sure that they're calibrated. So you say the blood flow is traveling at this speed. How do you verify that? So we have different testing tools and we actually have a whole testing lab you know, dedicated to this. Anytime there's a software update to our, our probe, uh, there's a whole suite of tests that we have to go through to make sure uh, things are just as one would expect. One of our competitors who shall remain nameless one day accidentally flipped the direction of blood flow. So all of the blood flow was flowing backwards. So that was one of our lessons, like, don't be like them. Now, in addition to operating the transducer lab, I was very fortunate that I also got to build and run a prototyping shop. So Butterfly is part of a larger organization that has many different startups, some of which are still in the stealth mode that we are not allowed to discuss. Um, but we have at our disposal um, CNC machining capabilities. Uh, we have 3D printers of all different sizes, including you know, this nice Fortis 450. Uh, you can print nylon, ABS, Ultem. Um, we can print out electrostatic plastics. You know, every once in a while, we have to do MIG or TIG welding. Um, we have a full, full sheet CNC router. So a lot of those... Uh, bits and pieces that I picked up along the way from Old Dominion University all the way through grad school and beyond, you know, really helped out in this regard. So digging into the guts of the butterfly probe a little bit, you know, before I give you the demo. So, you know, I mentioned that it was a CMUT based technology. So unfortunately, I don't know as much about the software for the butterfly probe. So I'm going to focus more on the hardware. And this is one of the true keys to our success. You know, we have a whole ASIC design team and we have a whole MEMS team, you know, that work to uh, produce this ultrasound on a chip. And I was very fortunate that, you know, I was in very early and I got to help with the design simulation and testing. So um, in this particular array that you can see here, there's about 9,000 individual elements. And with this custom ASIC, it has both analog and digital on it, and it can do about a half a trillion fixed point operations per second. So when you start to think about that, that's about 11 DVDs worth of information every second flowing through this chip. Now, in addition to our chip, you know, uh, in this open uh, probe here, we actually have a power board, a signal board, and a battery. So when we plug into our cell phone, tablet, um, Android phone, iPhone, uh, we're not using their power. We're, we're completely self-contained. So we have our own digital team. Uh, we have a board layout team. So, you know, it's really a team effort. It's a, there's a mechanical team for the removable cable, for the housings, so for the thermal. Uh, it, it's really quite impressive to see all of this come together in such a short period of time. So this is our updated version. This is the IQ+. Plus. And when we look at, you know, what are, what do CMUTs give us? Uh, they give us a lot of capability. Because we have this 2D array um, that is very broadband. Um, now, this is a little bit more on the technical note for CMUTs, is that they're very broadband. They can transmit at many different frequencies. And because now we have the ability to address subsets of those transducers, and we have the ability to transmit at different frequencies, we have the ability to turn our probe into a phased array probe, a curved probe for like a curvilinear probe, um, or even a linear probe. 
So we like to call this a whole body scanner because with just a flick of a switch, I can electronically go between all of these different imaging modes um, and simulate all of these different types of probes. Now, if anybody's ever had a, an ultrasound, um, you'll go to the cart and you'll see the different probes on the sides and they all have different applications. So depending upon what you want to look at, you know, are you looking at the heart? Are you looking at you know, the carotid? So in the heart, you're gonna be looking at low frequency um, transmission. Um, for the carotid, you're gonna look at high frequency transmission. You wanna get a lot of resolution. Um, the different types of imaging modes that we support right now, so M mode, B mode, color Doppler, power Doppler, pulsed wave Doppler, um, and what I'm going to show you is the differences between M mode and B mode as well, for those people not as familiar with ultrasound. Now, once you start to put all of this stuff together and you combine it with the software and deep learning that Butterfly has available, you also get a lot of extra features. So, for example, instead of just uh, doing a, a single scan, we can actually scan both in azimuth and in elevation. So think of it as a two-dimensional scan. And as soon as you're able to do that, now you can start doing volume renderings. So one of the new features is our 3D bladder scan. So with the 3D bladder scan, you can hold the probe up to your bladder. You can hit a button. It will go through, scan the bladder, and it will actually give you a volume. And with those volumes, you can do a volume rendering. And you can see you know, everything that's going on inside the bladder. Another really interesting aspect is needle guidance. So when you're starting to uh, do intervention that requires a needle, so you wanna hit you know, an artery or a vein um, and you need some help seeing what's going on, you know, you're looking for the needle you know, in the image. And now we have the ability to highlight it and really point it out to you know, the anesthesiologist or whoever else is you know, doing the needle intervention. So in this image all the way on the bottom right, if you see that blue line, you know, that's the needle that's being highlighted. And that's being accented using software to recognize that the needle is present in this image. And you know, that allows you to you know, see exactly where you need to go. Uh, oftentimes, this is necessary for nerve uh, intervention. And you need very precise control over where that needle is going. So these are you know, some of the uh, features from the butterfly. Now, I wanted to make sure I had enough time to give you a good demonstration before we have questions. So let me see if I can uh, connect my phone quickly. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing uh, for a second. Or end this show. Okay. I'm going to connect my Okay. So here I have already downloaded the Butterfly IQ app. And here I have my Butterfly IQ Plus. This is an engineering mode, uh, engineering model. So I, I am not a sonographer. So uh, these images may not be the prettiest, but I think they will give you a good idea of how easy it is to use. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take my phone, I'm going to plug it in. It's going to recognize that I've plugged in a Butterfly IQ. I'm going to say, yes, please open up the app. So it's going to make a connection. So in terms of a work stream, uh, there's many things you could do. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is go up here and look at my patient details. So in the top right, the author, Jamie Zahorian, I'm going to archive it to my transducer test folder. My patient details I put in as, you know, just a name test test. Um, worksheets, there's all sorts of traditional scans that you might want to do and you want to go through and make sure you collect all of the different images. But for now, I'm just going to go ahead and start scanning. So now I've got my probe. And over on the left-hand side, on the bottom right, or bottom left, sorry, I have all of the different major presets. So abdomen, abdomen deep, bladder imaging, cardiac, um, nerve. Um, and I'm going to go over here uh, to vascular carotid. 
So when I go through and I select one of these presets, it actually electronically changes the chip. So it reconfigures it with the transmit frequency, um, the pulse rep rate, the beam steering angles, um, all of the different uh, the sub apertures that we want to use. So I'm going to go ahead and hit select. OK. So unfortunately, we have not figured out a way to get away with not using ultrasound gel. If somebody could figure that out, they could make a lot of money. So I'm going to put some ultrasound gel here on my probe. And you see, all of a sudden, I've got some images. Now I have reflections acoustically from the top of the gel. So I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to start scanning my carotid. And, and there we go. So there's one view of my carotid. Now, within the app, I can easily, with one finger, I can adjust the depth. I can adjust the gain to try and get the optimal image. I can also freeze it just like that, and I can start doing you know, measurements. So with one thumb, I can move a, I can put in a circle, and it will tell me the area. It'll tell me the circumference. If I want to save a photo of that into my folder for this particular uh, session, I can. I can go back. I can unfreeze it. So we talked about you know, blood flow. So I'm going to turn this in the opposite direction. So now we're going to look at the blood flowing in and out of my brain. So I'm going to go over here to Actions. And now I've got Color Doppler. And so I can change the window. And now you can see the blood flowing. And you can see in which direction it's flowing. And just for giggles, I'm going to rotate the probe 180 degrees so that you can see that it's going to change color now. Well, let's see if I can find it again. Oh, there we are. And now it's flowing blue. So plus or minus, you know, as you can see in the upper right hand corner. So now I have the probe orientation such that it thinks the blood is flowing in the negative direction. So that's with respect to this uh, indicator on the probe. So I'm going to turn off color Doppler. And I'm just going to find a good image of my carotid there. Now, let's take a look. So right now, we're doing um, B mode. So now let's go to M mode. And now we can see, you know, as we're, we're going along here, um, it's going to do the lines. And I can see how much you know, my artery is expanding and contracting. You know, again, I could freeze it. I could save a photo for later analysis. I could go in. I could put in a line. I could go through and figure out, you know, what is the distance here? I can save that. Uh, I'm going to go to unfreeze. And OK, so that's my carotid. So as fast as I can do this, so let's take a look. So I go to the presets. Let's say I want to go to uh, cardiac. Boom, select. And now the transducer has already changed over to cardiac imaging mode. I'm going to see if I can get for you guys a picture of my heart valves. So I've gotten pretty good at this over time, even while sitting up, which is not ideal. And there are sonographers that specialize in cardiac imaging alone. So that's how tricky it is. And so let's see here if I can find a good view. So you're going through the ribs now. So the view would be quite difficult. Oh, but there we are. I'm going to change the gain a little bit. And so there you can see my heart valves flapping. So that's actually my heart. And those are the valves inside. So I can also start to look at like color Doppler. I can move the my, my window. And I can start to take a look at what kind of flow do I see in the heart. Ooh. 
you know, if I need to, I can freeze it. Um, so let me turn off colored Doppler. So I can also take videos. So there's a whole myriad of tools available. And then later on, I can go back, I can look at my captures. I can go through edit. Um, and I'm doing this all right here on my cell phone in front of you live. And now that we're sort of software defined a bit, you know, we have lots of options for developers. So every week I hear about new presets, new ways to use our technology. Um, what are the um, clinical needs uh, you know, based on what we're seeing. And we have the ability to release those, you know, as long as they're proven safe and viable. So at this point, um, if there's any questions, I would love to take some questions. So first of all, thank you very much, Jamie. That was a very informative presentation. Uh, I hope that the, the viewers understand the value in learning how you got to where you are. Uh, first of all, by just having fun, <laughs> uh, tinkering with things. Uh, you have taught everybody the value of networking. Uh, networking is something that is important to all of us, even to uh, an awful person like me. We continue to network and continue to use those networks uh, for everybody's uh, advantage. Uh, so again, as I said before, you can write questions in the same window that you are watching the presentation. If you can make it a little smaller on the bottom, there's a text box. Uh, feel free to uh, write your question and we'll try to answer them as soon as we get to see them. Um, well, uh, so while we wait for the students to pose their questions, uh, Jamie, uh, what was the biggest challenge in, in, when you first started working at Butterfly? I mean, you, they had something, and they, but they needed something else. So what was the, the big jump that you can talk about today? Well, I think, you know, in some ways, nailing down the product requirements, you know, was, was very tricky early on. And then making sure that we met those product requirements. You know, we had this idea about what we wanted to build, uh, but we didn't know to what level, you know, we needed our transducer technology. And then beyond that, uh, this is the very first uh, FDA cleared CMUT based device. So with this technology, there was a, there are a lot of predicate devices based on piezo technology, but there are a lot of things that we needed to do differently. So kind of understanding what did we need to do to get this into production as well. That was a, a huge hurdle actually. Okay, great. So let me read you a question. James Latchell from ODU asks, very interesting presentation. What was the major factor in choosing to use an ASIC over an FPGA for this design? So there is no way that an FPGA would ever be able to fit underneath our die and do everything we needed to do. So not only do we have analog circuitry, but we also have digital circuitry. Um, you know, we, in addition to our custom ASIC, uh, we have an additional FPGA, uh, you know, on the side to help process data, but uh, yeah, that combination of analog and digital is just, you know, really key. In school, both at the undergraduate level and the graduate level, you were always involved in extracurricular activities. Are you involved in any extracurricular activities while you work? Uh, so I actually was involved with a few. Um, so in the pre-COVID times, I was helping out with the first robotics program here in Guilford. And it was actually super beneficial from a networking perspective. Uh, I found one of the gentlemen that is a superstar employee. I asked around and I said, okay, you know, you all are smart people. You know, people in college, uh, graduate school, give me that person who just knows how to get things done, who spent more time, who spends almost more time tinkering, you know, and that person who everybody goes to when they need help on their senior project. And they came back with one name. Um, and I called him up and I was like, Hey, are you looking for a job? I was like, I've got a job for you. And he's like, yes. And so we were able to hire him and he has just been phenomenal. So he works in our prototyping shop. 
He's worked for the transducer team. He does, uh, you know, circuit design. He does uh, SMT work. He does machining. Um, and this is an undergrad level uh, person. So he didn't even go to graduate school. I'm actually kind of hoping he will one day. Great. Thank you, Jamie. I was just reminded that our audience uh, spans um, uh, quite a bit of a range of ages. So mm -hmm. not everybody's familiar with your our acronyms, SMT. ASIC, FPGA, could you please talk a little bit about what those things mean? So an ASIC is an application-specific integrated circuit. So um, oftentimes, you, know, you have a computer and it has a processor. That processor uh, does a bunch of different things. It has to be versatile. You know, it can play video. It can multiply numbers. But if all you're doing is multiplying numbers, you know, why waste time on processing video? And so our particular application specific circuit is focused on ultrasound, which means that, you know, you can really constrain the, the processing uh, to only what you need. So you can fit a lot more onto a smaller chip. Um, and that helps to really keep the cost down. So we're making this chip in high volume and it allows us to sell these probes for less than $2,000 which is you know, a great selling point for anybody who wants one in like a developing country. And kind of like Blu-ray players or anything like that, the price is just gonna come down over time as we get better and better at making these. Uh, let's see, what was the other acronym? SMT was uh, like surface mount um, technology. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, so. So what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, so when you have a printed circuit board, so with the metal traces, and you want to put on like a capacitor or uh, a specific, you know, integrated circuit, um, you put down something called a solder paste, uh, which is kind of a liquidy um, suspension of solder. Uh, you put down the small component, and then you put it into an oven for reflowing. So it heats up, it actually turns to solder, and you get, you know, these nice densely packed, um, uh, circuits. I was looking to see if I had a good example of one here. Uh, you know, in the presentation that I showed with the the board open, all of those little square blobs were different capacitors. You know, that were put on through automated machinery, uh, through the you know this SMT type process. Uh, FPGA was yeah field programmable gate array, right? Uh, yes. Yes. So <laughs> every once in a while, even I use the acronyms so frequently, and I know <clears throat> they are, but I forget. Um, so that's essentially, uh, ooh, I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it, but you have uh, oftentimes like a logic circuit that has you know different gates, and an FPGA is typically is a mesh network of these gates that can be programmed to do different things very fast and very efficiently. Um, I'm trying to think if there's a better definition for that. It's a little bit tough. That's the key thing, I think. Yeah. You get to synthesize, you get to build the, the network, the circuit. Yes. On top of that hardware. I yes. think that was good. You, I think you have already answered one of our other questions. But let's see. Jaden Hubbard asks, is a butterfly probe out publicly for sale or is it just used professionally? So the butterfly probe, we have two varieties, actually, that are for sale. So one is for physicians. So currently, um, it's only available to a doctor or a medical professional. Um, we're working to change that, though. Through the, the software and usability, uh, what we really wanted to do is make this something that somebody could have as a home tool eventually. So you have a thermometer at home. Why not have an ultrasound probe? You, know, you could check your carotid. You could check you know, heart problems. Um, if you're on a specific medication that requires you to be monitored, um, uh, people with bladder issues, if they want to be able to, you know, scan their own bladders. Uh, the other version we have is actually for vets. So uh, to scan cats and dogs. So, yeah. you know, turns out, you know, pets can't really tell you what's wrong. And, you know, an ultrasound scan is, can be extremely informative. You can look for obstructions in a cat, um, things of that nature. So, and due to the cheap nature, it allows, uh, more veterinarians to be able to buy something like this and have in their practice or to take, you know, in the pocket of your coat, take with you in the field. Excellent. Uh, question from James Lacho again. 
what if you can answer this what frequency ranges do these transducers operate on also and here come more acronyms how are the frequencies generated on the pcb vco DAC? okay so um, ultrasound is typically in the you know one to 20 megahertz range and there's a couple of higher frequencies the butterfly probe uses around one to 12 megahertz in that frequency range you know so Low frequencies are very good for penetrating the body. Um, the body attenuates the signals uh, very much at high frequencies. So when you're doing the carotid, you can use a very high frequency and you can get very good temporal resolution. So you can see very fine features. Um, uh, the way that the pulses are generated is actually on the ASIC itself. So we actually have pulsing circuitry built into the ASIC. So you know there's a, an external clock signal but a lot of that is done right on our own custom chip. Excellent. Um, we have another comment, a, a clarification to our description of, of an FPGA. It can be simply thought of as a collection of lookup tables <laughs> in hardware. <laughs> yes, that, that is a great description. Yeah. Thank you to Professor Belfort. Uh, Okay, what would you recommend a student, uh, whether it's high school or undergraduate, uh, if they're somewhat interested in that type of work that you are currently doing? What, what would be a good pathway? I know you have described your path. So, you know, if I had, you know, looking back as well on some of the things that I wish I had done sooner, no matter where I am, I think there's no way to get around programming these days. So. Try and learn some form of programming as soon as you can. And the nice thing is that's accessible to almost everybody. You can start learning Python online. You can um, start learning how to program a microcontroller for about $10. You can buy an Arduino and start to learn about you know, clock cycles and interrupts, um, things of that nature. I think going forward, uh, you know, some mechanical engineers may disagree with me, but uh, I think there's no way to get away from programming and the computer side and the sensor side of life. They were always going to be integrated in the future. You know, even our mechanical engineers, you know, they use SolidWorks, they use CAD programs. Um, and some of the best mechanical engineers I know automatically generate, you know, some of their models from programs. So having a good, strong, fundamental mm -hmm programming background, I think, is, is a good way to get started, you know, into understanding a lot of how these things work. Thank you. Uh, without putting you on the spot, are there, is, is there a chance for a student to apply for internships at Butterfly? Yes, there are. And not only at Butterfly, but at other four combinator or four catalyzer companies. So okay. if you chance, um, you can go to the Butterfly website. Um, you can also look up for Catalyzer. Um, and some of the other startups also have internship opportunities. Sometimes we have interns over a summer, and sometimes we have internships you know, like for a longer period of time. And we take everybody from, uh, I've taken in high school uh, level interns, local to the area, just because of mm -hmm. you know, housing issues, um, all the way through you know, PhD candidates. Um, so we have a wide variety of options available. Some of that has been a little bit tampered due to COVID, but you know, especially next year, you know, if that's something you're interested in, you know, definitely take a look at the the Butterfly website and the uh, you know any anything related to Four Catalyzer. Okay, excellent. Um, I don't see any more questions, so let me just thank you for a second. Oh, <laughs> another reminder. Uh, in fact, you brought it up, uh, Jamie, uh, as, a, as a segue to, back to Reyes, which is where I'm going. We can go back. Uh, you mentioned the need for everybody, really everybody, to learn to program. Uh, I'm, I'm aware that it's computer science courses are becoming intertwined in all of K-12 education. And I keep telling everybody that it's not just for people that want to become a CS major. That's for everybody. It's just yeah. another tool everybody has to pick up. Reyes uh, hosted an eight-week course on Python <gasps> uh, last summer, which I believe is still available. Uh, oh. and, uh, and so they can just go to the Reyes website, which was at the beginning, and I'll show you that in a little bit, and you'll be able to find the link uh, to the Python free course. Uh, so 
yes, uh, I, this, I, I'll mention this to the instructor because I, I heard this from some students, but the title said Python for physics. I said, that's okay, <laughs> it's Python. <laughs> yes, the problem you'll be solving might be physics, but all of us have to deal with that. So that's not, not a problem. Okay, so uh, thank you very, very much for your time, Jamie, for preparing and giving us this time with you. I really appreciate it. I think we have all learned a lot. Uh, but let me finish the conversation by once again sharing my screen. And I want to finish the presentation by reminding you of the next two Reyes events, which are on November 19th by the director of Jefferson Labs here in Newport News. And on December 1st, uh, Dr. Ele. Ellen Oshoa, a former NASA astronaut and former NASA Johnson Space Center director. So these are two wonderful additional opportunities to learn about the work that some excellent people such as Jamie are currently doing. Let me go back to this page so that you can see the ODU EDU slash Reyes website where you can find more about what we have done in the summer, including uh, getting access to the Python for Physics free course uh, so you can get started. So again, thank you very much, everybody. We're going to end the live stream at this moment. Thank you. <laughs>